tonight we're going to um, have a presentation by Lauren Taylor. Um, Lauren is an oral historian and um, a psychiatric so social worker and an adjunct professor at the Columbia University School of Social Work. Um, and recently she served as a project coordinator for the Hartford Partnership Program on Aging Education. Ms. Taylor has been on the staff um, at um, Columbia since 1994 and has worked with the elderly extensively and is a field advisor and field instructor for social work students who are interning in many different um, agencies on aging. Um, in 2002, 2003, I'm sorry, in conjunction with the School of Social Work, um, Ms. Taylor made an educational film about sexuality and aging funded by the Hartford Foundation and distributed by the New York Academy of Medicine in 2005. Ms. Taylor created a second film, um, which brought together um, young social worker students and older women in a dialogue about aging. Um, as an oral historian, um, Ms. Taylor has conducted many, many um, life history interviews and is going to talk a little bit on tonight about the um, distinguishing features of psychiatric social work interviews and the interviews that she does as an oral historian. Um, in a, um, just a little related note, we have a wonderful um, uh, experience here tonight of really merging the disciplines quite literally as we have social work students and oral historians in the same room, so I'm expecting a really wonderful conversation. Um, um, and one more note, um, Ms. Taylor and I actually were in school together here <laughs> as colleagues in the oral history program. And we um, finished before I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's a really double honor to be here and a pleasure. Um, one of the wonderful um, uh, stories and um, articles about stories that Lauren shared with, with our cohort was an article um, in Scientific American about storytelling and um, about the idea of myths that are present in all of our lives and the absolute need for storytelling as, a, as a, just a human drive. Um, and Lauren's going to speak a little bit more about that tonight. And, um, okay, I guess without any further ado, Lauren. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, in this audience are not only oral historians, uh, students, but also students from my human sexuality class who are here because I usually teach at this time on Tuesdays and I <laughs> requested that they come here <laughs> to hear me. Uh, and my mother and my daughter and some good friends. <laughs> anyway, um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to, I, I wish that, that we had time, but we're too big a group to do the exercise that I did with the oral history students in a smaller group just before this meeting where I asked each of them to think about the history, the, the background of their names, um, who gave them the name, what's the cultural significance, of, do, you, do you have a nickname, how do you feel about your name, because it's a wonderful way for us to all get to know each other, but we unfortunately don't have time to do that tonight. So just think about it as we proceed, because we're going to be talking about um, a, a, someone's story, and we're going to start with this person's name. Um, I'm going to get you going right away on, um, on an exercise. And um, because I'm drawing material from both oral history and social work, I hope those of you who are here from both disciplines will get something from this exercise. Um, I'm going to pose a question first, and, and then I'm going to describe to you what we're all going to do as a group. Um, the oral historian Donald Ritchie in the book Doing Oral History, A Practical Guide, asked the question, should the interviewer be an objective or neutral observer? And given tonight's topic, I think my question to you is, can the interviewer be a neutral or objective observer? In the past, we really, I think, in oral history and in social work, there was kind of the feeling that we should come to the to come to the table as a, a sort of a blank slate, that we really shouldn't bring with us our biases and prejudices, that we should leave them at home, because they might in some way influence the course of the work, be it an oral history interview or an interview in a therapy session. Um, but what I'm really going to focus on tonight is the fact that we do bring these with us, that we carry them with us, that we have long traditions of of cultural legacy that we bring with us, 
and that if we can learn to become self-aware and to utilize this material, it, it can really help us in our work, whichever discipline we're, we're working in, or in both as I am, and later on I'm going to talk a little bit about the convergences and divergences of oral history and therapy and what it means to be working in one discipline with the background in another and vice versa. Um, so at, looking at that question, you know, can the interviewer be objective or neutral? What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story, and this is a story of a client that I worked with. And when I say client, for those of you who are not coming from the mental health field, this is what we call patients now in mental health clinics, not in hospitals, they're still patients, but in an attempt to kind of e equalize the balance between the worker and, and the individual, we use the word client. Um, I'm going to tell you this woman's story. This is a woman I worked with many, many years ago. and. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything about her ethnicity. And I'm going to stop every couple of sentences and I'm going to ask you to tell me what you're thinking, just given what I'm, what I'm relating to you. So I'd like to start with her name. Her name is Gloria. So take a minute to think about somebody named Gloria mm -hmm. and what comes to mind. Just jump in, raise your hands. My mom. Your mom, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have associations with the name Gloria that might be different than Zanetta's mom? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's probably a way too specific. I think of like Italian American, like born in the fifties. Okay, <laughs> Italian American born in the fifties. So we so far we have well, at least you don't. It doesn't. It's not since you're thinking of her mother. Okay, we have three people, um, three people who have have given us. You know, well, the two of you have the same view, okay. <laughs> two people have given us, given us completely different views of, now I don't know anything about your mother, so I have no idea what her background is, um, but um, an Italian-American in the 50s. Anyone else have associations with the name Gloria? Well, it, uh, it gives me an age reference. It's not a name that's used for young people passed away today, so I think of somebody 50 or older. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with that. So already just these few hands that went up, we have we have some context, perhaps, some cultural context, but we really don't know what it is. Um, Gloria is actually 56, and she's the hub of a bustling family which has sort of survived many tragedies. So any thoughts about Gloria? She's the hub of a bustling family. Any ideas about what this family might, might be like, what that means to be the hub of a bustling family? Any thoughts about that? Yeah. It's a busy, productive family. Okay. They're going to school, parents are working. Uh, there's lots of energy stuff moving around, maybe after school. Somebody has to take the kids to after school, things at sports. Okay, so a picture of what a bustling family might need. Any other ideas? Maybe she's not married. Maybe she's not married. Interesting. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that um, someone here mentioned parents because, um, you know, Coming from a single family household, when I think of a, like a bustling family, it's just I think of my mom. So like, in my mind, Gloria was this single mother, so. Mm -hmm. Well, just think of this as some kind of a tapestry that we're weaving with all these different possibilities. Um, Gloria's husband, who had begun suffering seizures after a head injury incurred while on active duty, sorry, Gloria's husband had begun suffering seizures after a head injury incurred while on active duty in Vietnam. Okay, so this tells us something about the historical context of Gloria's husband. So it turns out Gloria has a husband, and he was in Vietnam. Any thoughts about what this might mean? It certainly places Gloria's husband in some kind of historical context. Any, any idea? And political context. And like political context. To Vietnam. Right. Uh, yeah. Oh, mm, lower middle, middle class. Okay, so it looks like maybe the family's lower middle class. Yeah. It puts Gloria in maybe a uh, caregiver position. Gloria in a caregiver mm -hmm. position. Yeah. Her husband's definitely been in America for a while, or at least he's been in America for a while. Mm -hmm. So already I, I feel like we're weaving this, this story out of these couple of sentences. Um, he was able to go back to work when he came after, after the war, he came back to this country, but he was subsequently disabled in a work-related accident nearly 30 years ago. Gloria had to become both mother and father to their three children. So I think you mentioned caregiver. Um, she, she now is a caregiver. 
Um, Gloria grew up in New York City, the third of four daughters. Her father was a hardworking man who valued education for his daughters. So what might that tell us about the family? Immigrant? immigrant family. Anybody else think this might be an immigrant family? And if so, why? What makes you say immigrant family? Well, the value in you know, the next generation receiving something, <coughs> especially education. And particularly for his daughters, does that, does that tell you something? Gloria did well in school and won a scholarship to a state college, but disappointed her father by turning it down and getting a secretarial job in a bank. <coughs> Thoughts about that? Strong headed. I mean, she was willing to be non compliant. <laughs> <laughs> Might there be other reasons why she turned down going to college and, and got a job? Yeah. She could have been married at that point. First child, possible. Okay. Other hands were up. Oh, similar. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say, oh, yeah. just more generally, like um, financial obligation. Okay. Um, so if we're looking at an Im immigrant family, maybe this a lower middle class family, maybe she was expected in some way to contribute to the household. We we don't know yet. Any other thoughts about why? Well, to me? my own mother. Um, that that was a mirror of my own mother. Um, mm -hmm. Who I asked many years later, like, Mom, she went to college in the city. And I think it had very much to do with women not valuing anyone in society. So we may be dealing with gender issues here as well. Um, well, we're about to find out. Um, Gloria had set, set her sights on marriage and family, and this seemed the quickest way to achieve her goal. So this is why Gloria turned down the scholarship. Gloria married a man like her father, industrious but constrained in his capacity to show love. Her husband, an only child, had grown up without a father and had no male role model in his life. Any ideas about this family? Any thoughts about Gloria and her role? Nothing new. Okay, let's go on. Did I see nothing? Um, when Gloria's husband had the accident, everything changed. He was in a coma for six months, and when he emerged, he was a different person, docile and childlike. Their son, who was eight years old at the time, became angry and confused. Gloria sought help for the family. So, we're starting to create a picture of Gloria. What does this tell you? We don't know what kind of help she sought, but... she went to her church, whether she went to a therapist, we, that we don't know, but, but her, her reaching out for help does tell us something about, about Gloria. Um, because Gloria's husband could no longer work, she had to become the breadwinner. Fortunately, her mother lived nearby and was able to help with the three young children. Any thoughts about that? So we have Gloria's mother who's available to, to help out with the kids. Well, she's not leaving the kids with her dad. Right. Right. Dad's not he, working. Right, because so dad can't, I mean, he's not in any condition to, to take care of um, the kids at this point. Yeah. It means she's living wherever her mother is, so geographically, mm -hmm. her family. Is anybody getting a, a picture, in, in, I mean, in your minds of what, what this family might be like, what the socioeconomic circumstances, the, the ethnicity? What I want you to do is to really kind of think about what's going on in terms of your awareness as you listen to this story. What, what kind of picture is coming to mind based on your assumptions, your expectations, your understanding of, of the era in which you grew up, et cetera? Okay. Um, work became Gloria's salvation. 
she began to take an interest in her career and rose up the corporate ladder to become a vice president at one of the largest financial institutions in New York City. In the 1980s, she was given an award for, an award for her achievements. So now what are we thinking about Gloria? Well, she probably earned a fair amount of money. You come from a Wall Street background, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the most prestigious financial institutions. She probably earned a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And and thinking about being a woman in a in you know in, in a large financial institution. She was a, probably a pretty tough customer. A tough, pretty tough <laughs> yeah. customer. And in the, the in the nineteen eighties. Yeah. Um, she wore a lot of those bows, those little ties. <laughs> <laughs> Big shoulder pads. Big shoulder pads. <laughs> Any, any thoughts about her in terms of her ethnicity at this point? Is there anything that you would rule out? Um, she sounds Irish to me. She sounds Irish? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else thinking she sounds Irish? So, Yeah, Luis? She all of a sudden became white to me. <laughs> she became white Like, too. I had this picture of a woman of color, and then after your last statement, she became white. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Was anybody else thinking that? Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go on. Um, as Gloria's children reached adulthood, she had to face a reality that was difficult for her. Both her daughters were married and had children, but her son was gay. It took her some time to accept. However, she adored her son and embraced his lover as one of the family. She's Irish Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else think something different at this point? Yeah. I think it gives new meaning to the term hub of the family, too. She's like the financial and emotional center of her family. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is just kind of elaborating on that concept. Mm -hmm. So now we might be picturing an, an old who's Irish Catholic, head of a, you know, the hub of a large family. Let's see what happens. Um, this is where some of the really horrendous tragedies of her life began. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Gloria's son developed some health problems and she denied her, st and remember this was, this I, when I wrote this, this was at a, at a time where, where having, having a, a diagnosis of, of AIDS was a death sentence. Um, she denied to herself what she knew to be true. Her, her son's lover had died of AIDS, her son was infected as well. And Gloria really, um, really was was angry at herself that she had not paid attention to his his developing illness because I think inside she knew what was going on and um, she felt somehow she could have had she attended to this earlier she could have she could have done something different. Um, when I'm when I give the chronology now, it's it's when I wrote this particular story. I was actually still working with Gloria, and I will give you the follow-up, and we're going to meet her on camera at the end of this. Um, <laughs> She's going to come through the door. <laughs> Actually, she almost did, because I have not spoken to Gloria in 10 years, and um, I called her when I knew I was going to be giving this workshop. She doesn't live in New York anymore, and she would love to have been able to be here. But um, anyway. Um, so two years ago, in this chronology, Gloria developed a respiratory infection that landed her in the hospital. She was under great stress at work and did not take care of herself when she became ill. What's this telling us? So here's this woman taking care of her whole family. Yeah. She's a workaholic. She's a workaholic, and, and what, what else is she, I mean, what is, what is she not doing? Care of she's not taking care of herself. She's taking care of everyone else, but she's not taking care of herself. The infection affected her heart, and she had to have open heart surgery. A pacemaker was implanted. Just a, in, in parentheses, when I show you the film, um, which was actually made as a part of a teaching film for the social work school uh, here at Columbia, um, the cameraman from the Center for New Media was miking Gloria and he kept picking up a Spanish radio station and he was running all over the building trying to figure out where this was coming from and it turns out her pacemaker was acting as a transmitter. <laughs> um, so the two weeks after Gloria came home from the hospital, her husband had a stroke. 
Their son had taken care of his father while Gloria was in the hospital, and he was now taking care of Gloria. But he was not feeling well either, and two weeks later he died. So this is a family with multiple, multiple layers of tragedy. At this point, Gloria had become quite depressed, understandably, and um, she was referred by the visiting nurse service for therapy at the clinic where I work. The past two years has been a journey of grief and recovery for Gloria and her family. When she first came for help, she was in such pain that she could tolerate only an occasional session. She was often un unable to leave the house for days at a time, but after a while, Gloria began to sense that the treatment was helping her, and she made the effort to get to her sessions. The whole family pulled together to help Gloria out of her depression. She was the center of their universe. So what are we seeing now in terms of Gloria and, and her life and her family? But they're they're really rallying around her, yeah. and they recognize that they can't let her they can't let her um, sink into a depression. Occasionally, Gloria brought a member of her family with me when she came to see me. Over time, I met both of her daughters, her husband, and even her nine-year-old grandson. And in the clinic where I work, um, having children come into the sessions is not something we usually do. But I felt it was important to given the family circumstances, to have her, her grandson come in, and I gave him some things to play with on the floor, and at a certain point, I turned to him, and I said to him, do you miss your uncle? And he said yes, because he was very close to his uncle. <coughs> and at that point, I said, well, you know, your, your grandma is here because it can help to talk to somebody, and, you know, I just, it, it, I included him in, in, the, in the session, and actually, he talked about his uncle, and I think that was... I think that was helpful for him because my sense was that the family was really rallying around Gloria and that everybody else was kind of having to fend for themselves. Um, at first, Gloria felt guilty, but as we, when she began, Gloria began to laugh again. After, after a period of time, she began to be able to laugh again. And at first she felt guilty, but as we explored her grief, she was able to express her loving and joyous feelings as well. Gloria and her family decided that they needed to begin a new phase of their lives, and Gloria accepted a generous retirement package from her job, and her family bought a large piece of property in Pennsylvania where they built homes. Uh, Gloria and her husband and their older daughter and family moved with Gloria's mother, and the, the younger daughter actually was in social work school and married and had a young child and wasn't ready to move yet, but they, they um, had a, a place for that family when, when the family wanted to join them. Um, her, uh, at, at a certain point, um, and so they moved to Pennsylvania, and then Gloria took custody of her 15 year, a niece's 15-year-old son. This boy's mother had just been released from prison, and his father left when he was a baby. Gloria wanted to give him the opportunity to grow up in a warm and loving family. So what, what's everybody thinking now? So here she is, they've started this new phase of their lives, and and now she's taking custody of her 15-year-old, her niece's 15-year-old son, and she wants to, to give him an opportunity. Yeah. Well, there's a huge commitment to family because, I mean, to buy land so that you can all live together on it, and, uh, uh, to, to, and then she's also taking custody of another family member. Like, they're very, there's very often a huge focus on family. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps also having lost her own son, the opportunity to, to take care of her, of her <coughs> nephew as well. Um, a few months ago, Gloria got up during the night and tripped on the family cat. She broke her leg and had to have surgery, followed by several weeks of rehabilitation. She's walking with a walker and will need to be fitted with a brace. But she has come through the experience with a determination not to let, her, let it pull her back into a depression. And I'm not going to tell you the last sentence of this because I'm going to let Gloria speak for herself. So what I'd like all of you to do is to try and create a mental picture of Gloria. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the interview that I did with her. Um, this was an interview that I did before I, before there ever was an oral history program here at Columbia. And I was doing it as part of a teaching film that I made for the social work school. 
And in this film, um, it was, it's a film actually on aging and sexuality, but there was one segment, and that is Gloria's story, that really didn't have much to do with sexuality. She didn't talk about sexuality except when I asked her specific pointed questions because that was the topic of the film and I really needed to ask her something about sexuality. Um, whereas the other people in the film talked very, very openly. In fact, I think the 30 some odd year old cameraman's eyes were popping out of his head when this 80 some odd year old woman was talking about her sex life. But, um, but when the film was put together, this, the social work school really the, the committee really felt that we should take this segment out and put it into a segment that had to do with culture and learning about culture. And I said, no, this really is how this woman talks about herself in terms of her sexuality. She talks about it in terms of her being a woman and what it means to her to be a woman in her culture. Um, and so they left it in and I'm very glad they did. So I'm gonna introduce you to Gloria, but I really want you to just think about what your assumptions are um, and when we listen to the interview, what I want you to do is to think about certain themes that come up, cultural themes, historical themes. You'll see that there's a tremendous emphasis in what she says um, on appearance and what appearance means to her and why it's important for her to, why it's so important to, to, to present yourself in a certain way. Now it's true, she worked in the corporate world and you know, you can probably attest to the fact that presentation is, is, is extremely important. Um, but there's a... Back then. Back then. <laughs> <laughs> so now. But, but there's a little key, there's a historical key in this interview, and I, I want you to see if you can pick it up and figure out what it is historically that might make this focus on appearance so important to Gloria. Um, and I also just want to point out that I was 10 years younger when I made this film, <laughs> and it's hard for me to watch it. <laughs> What I, what I was going to say about, about the appearance is that at a certain point, Gloria talks about the fact that her, her grandmother picked cotton, but when she went to church on Sunday, she always made sure that they had, as Gloria said, a starched hanky and white gloves. And to me, this was one of the keys in the interview of the historical context for the importance of appearance in Gloria's life. So if we're thinking about about bringing culture to the table, what what would it mean to pick up a cue like that in an interview? What would the importance of of this little this little moment that she talked about her grandmother? Because if you didn't hear that when she talks about getting her nails done and going shopping with her daughters, um, you might think that this is a woman who is looking at the superficialities of of appearance and what it means, but. But how would you interpret this this meaning of her of, of this what she said about her grandmother? So could the appearance also be like having to keep it all together? You know, not not just like how you present yourself like appearance wise, but also like how you maintain your emotions. I think partly, but I also think if we look at the sort of historical roots in it. I was going to say in terms of um, sort of trying to garner that respect, uh, being a woman of color, being mm -hmm. people of color, especially mm -hmm. back then, you're trying to sort of set yourself above what is thought of you. Mm -hmm. And so like in that way, always being well dressed, being neat, mm -hmm. being perfect, being above like what just what yeah. people were thinking. And I think if we can look at that that you know theme in terms of a cultural historical theme and what the what that what that meant to Gloria and also given the chaos in her life and, and the multiple layers of tragedy, what it meant to her to, to keep it together as we were saying, and to present an, an exterior that was that was you know a cut above as as you said to to the rest of the world, and it's one of the sort of cues that we pick up in an interview whether it's an oral history interview or an interview in, in, in therapy or in social work. And, and that is the, the body language, the presentation. So if we take a story like Gloria's and we, we start to analyze it from the point of view of, of culture, um, and this is where I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint, even though I don't, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, um, because there's certain things that I just wanna show you. Uh, where is, 
I want to start out, and my social work students have already heard me talk about this, but I want to talk about belief systems because I think this is an important thing to, to know. Um, oh, somebody wanted to do, do you want the lights on? No, no we, we can leave the lights on. Yeah, we can leave the lights on. I think. Um, in order to understand where somebody is coming from in an interview, it's really important for us to think about um, about the, the, the kind of template of belief system. And I think actually it's better with the light on. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I think it's better with the light on so I can see you if I, if I need to interact. Um, I, I'm going to give you a kind of a template of our belief systems. And this isn't a hard and fast sort of template. There's a lot of crossover, but it's, it's, an, it's a place to start. Um, and if you think about belief systems the way you would think about the strength of the ripples when you throw a stone into a pond, um, the strongest, most core beliefs are at the center. And those are what are called our primitive or core beliefs. And primitive not in any negative sense, but primitive because they're so fundamental to who we are. Um, any thoughts about what might be examples of our core or primitive beliefs? And if we change something in the primitive belief system, we shake up the whole system profoundly. Um, no, that's coming next. That's coming next. Um, people care about each other. People care about each other? Could be. That would be. It would be. It would be nice if that were um, <laughs> were but part of the primitive belief system. The core belief. The core belief. It's something like I am a man. I am a woman. Um, this is a, the, the sky is blue. Wherever you go in in the world, and it's interesting. I've been reading a, a book recently called Through the Language Glass that has to do with how language affects our view of the world. And in Homer's time, the description of the sky was not as blue, but it was wine colored. And is that because people saw it differently or because the language was different? And analyzing it, it, it looks as though the language was different, which makes sense to us now. But, but earlier when there were analyses of Homer, there was this idea that maybe somehow people hadn't inherited the capacity to see blue yet. Um, and so, because there wasn't much blue other than the sky in Homer's time that people would see, because blue is a, is a color as a dye that came much later historically. And if you think about it, what is blue in nature? Occasionally a flower, but we don't see much that's blue that's not artificial. Um, however, um, now our understanding is that the understanding of color and that the sky is blue is one of our core or fundamental beliefs. If you think about something like One's, um, one's, one's identification as male or female, for example, if you change this, you will shake up the whole system. For somebody who feels that they are born in a different, in a, in a different body, in the body that, that isn't consistent with how they feel inside, or what happens when you get old and the body that you've lived with all these years, or you become disabled, the body you've lived with all these years suddenly betrays you. Your, your fundamental sense of yourself and your core belief is going to change. It's going to change the whole, the whole system. If we move on to the next layer, and remember, think again of this as, as the ripples in a pond, they get weaker as we go further away or less, less um, important. Peripheral beliefs. Our peripheral belief system is our system of beliefs that are derived from authority figures. So somebody mentioned religion. That's a good example of beliefs derived from authority. Um, what are some, I mean, where do we learn these, these peripheral beliefs? Parents, Parents families, um, from our culture, from authority figures. If we change something in the peripheral belief system, yes, it will shake the system, but it's not going to shake it as profoundly as if we change something in the core belief system. And then we move on to the <coughs> last layer, which is the inconsequential <coughs> belief system. And inconsequential, not because they don't have any value or meaning, but inconsequential because this is the system of beliefs that has to do with our personal taste. And whether you eat this breakfast cereal or that breakfast cereal, you know, unless there's something circumstantial that, that, that changes, is not really going to make much difference in terms of the belief systems on which your, your culture is, is founded. Um, and if you think about it developmentally, what's the time of life where the inconsequential beliefs are changing from second to second? 
adolescents. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I always think of one of my one of my kids whose teacher said all of the nonconformists go to this side of the room in middle school, and all of the conformists go to the side, and the whole class went to the nonconformist side. So, um, so keep this in mind as a template. Again, it doesn't, it's not a, you know, it, for purposes of a PowerPoint, I had to draw it as, as distinct belief systems. Of course, there's, there's some, some crossover between them. Um, and in, one interesting thing about belief systems, there was a, a writer of, um, psychologist who wrote a book, um, his name was Milton Rogich, some of you may have heard of him, and he wrote a book called The Three Crises of Ypsilanti. And Ypsilanti, Michigan, there was a mental hospital there, and he went and he lived for a couple of years as a participant observer in this mental hospital in Ypsilanti. And a very common delusion among men who are mentally ill is that they are Jesus Christ. And he had a group of men all of whom claimed to be Jesus Christ. And he followed them over the course of a um, period of a couple of years. And a lot of the men dropped out of the group, but three remained, and hence the three Christs of Ypsilanti. And in, in his descriptions and, and transcripts of their, of their discussions, one of the things that emerged was a fundamental belief, and that is that no matter how delusional these men were, they knew that the, each of them was I. They knew that each of them was I and not you. And, um, and, and that there was a certain value in being I. One of the men said, well, you can't be Jesus Christ because you know, I'm Jesus Christ. But he knew that, that he couldn't be this other person and, and that that was a part of his fundamental belief system. In order also to think about and understand our cultural beliefs and how they impact our work, um, and those of you who have a psychology background may be familiar with the five-factor model of personality. Um, in the five-factor model of personality, researchers looked at personality traits all over the world in all kinds of cultures and all kinds of it was an enormous enormous study of personality and what was discovered was that there were five major factors that occurred in every society in every culture they may have been expressed differently but that they were present in terms of our understanding of another human being and another human being's behavior and way of relating to us and you can remember them with the word ocean. Um, openness, and again, each of these is a continuum, so it's not like somebody is open or closed, but there's a degree of openness, and we understand it within a cultural context, and we understand it, um, we also understand it within the circumstances, so I may be very open with my, with my best friends, but I may be less open, let's say, in a work, in a work setting, for example. And how does that impact our work? This is, a, this is certainly a question that social work students grapple with all the time. How much of myself do I share with my clients? And um, this came up in, in the discussion with the oral history students as well. Um, you know, what, what, what do I do? How much do I say in an oral history interview? Um, conscientiousness, we in our society certainly value a high degree of conscientiousness. Um, extroversion is interesting because how we interpret that in terms of our culture, whether we make eye contact, um, whether it's considered disrespectful to make eye contact, uh, whether a high degree of extroversion is prized in a, in a society or not is something that we need to, to understand when we're doing an interview. Agreeableness is something I think certainly all of us value a high degree of agreeableness. And here neuroticism, which is kind of a word that's out of date these days, really means level of anxiety. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about parallels between therapy and oral history, because I'm really drawing from both disciplines since I have experience in both, <coughs> both uh, backgrounds. Um, there was a um, there. There has been an effort in um, in in therapy, uh, driven by a group of women who found an institutional home at Wellesley College called the Stone Center for Research on Women, to try and formulate a kind of therapy that's come to be called the relational cultural model of therapy, and this very much parallels some of the emphasis in oral history on um, intersubjectivity. And what it really means is the meeting space between the interviewee and the interviewer or between the client and the worker is where the work takes place. Whereas in the past, there was an attempt to kind of sanitize the, the experience and the idea that either the 
interviewer or the therapist should come to the table um, uh, and, and kind of have the upper hand in a sense. And, and what's going on in both fields now, fortunately, is moving in the direction of a kind of an equalization, which doesn't mean that you don't bring your professional expertise, but it, it, what it means is that, that it's a dialogue and that a lot of this dialogue takes place through stories. So Jean Baker Miller, who was one of the founders of the Stone Center, talks about what she calls the five good things. The first one being zest. And if we think about Gloria, how do we, how do we, where do we find the place for zest in her life? Does she seem like somebody who has a high degree of zest? I think we could all agree that she does, and I, I wish we could get to, to meet her. But um, clarity. Clarity meaning, in terms of how we view a situation, that we're able to view a, a situation with an understanding of what what the ramifications, what the background is. Sense of self-worth, obviously, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Creativity and productivity, and a desire for more connection. And connection is something that is a critical, critical word in both the interview process in oral history and in therapy. And I think that, that if we focus on the idea of connection and we think about what the interview brings us, um, it, it is a sense of connection and that's what we're really striving for. If we're looking to analyze a story, um, we look at it from the point of view of the structure of the story, from the point of view of the socio-cultural influences on the story, the interpersonal aspects and the personal as well. And what's interesting in terms of how we learn this, how we how we learn to communicate within our culture, um, from the moment a child can understand the spoken word, his parents begin to speak to him or her from a common past, often going back several generations. So. Um, I couldn't resist putting a picture of my granddaughter in there. Um, she's now two and a half and she talks up a storm, but um, even here at this young age when she wasn't really talking, you can see the, the in, she's already beginning to understand the, the, the spoken word and, and the way we communicate. Um, if I say to you once upon a time, those of you who were born here and grew up speaking English, what, what, what does it bring to mind? A fairy tale. A fairy tale. How do we know? How do we know that once upon a time is going to mean a fairy tale? They all begin that way. Um, and, and what do you think of? And when you hear once upon a time, what, 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 what kind of context do you, do you imagine yourself in? Disney movies. What? Disney movies. Disney movies. Disney movies. That's interesting. Yeah. It's like a time that's not existent any longer. So it's like sort of a timeless quality. Childhood. Childhood. Usually something that ends happily. Something that ends happily. So just in these few words, you can see how much for for those of you who grew up with once upon a time, how much is in, you know, <coughs> not even a whole sentence, and 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 what we what we interpolate and what we bring in terms of our understanding of the culture. Um, some cultures reinforce the value of storytelling and some don't. And I think one of the things that we've really lost in, in the United States, in, in, in modern culture, is the value of storytelling. Um, I, I know when I was growing up, my grandmother told a lot of stories and I wish I had listened more carefully. Um, but certainly as, as a as a therapist and as an oral historian, the story is really what what is the is central to to my work. And even if you think about what it means when you go to the doctor, you tell the doctor a story. The doctor may turn it into a case or a case study or a case history, but in fact, you're telling a story. And um, I know Columbia has the narrative medicine program now, and Rita Sharon, who's one of the one of the founders of the um, the whole field of narrative medicine, I remember hearing her tell a story about an, a man who brought in his elderly father, and the father was um, having difficulty because he he was having trouble getting he was having trouble with incontinence, and in really taking the time to talk to this this pair, the father and son, what 
what she learned was that the father's wheelchair was too big to get through the bathroom door so he couldn't get to the bathroom. And had she not taken the time to do that and just simply written a prescription for a medication for him, it would have been a whole different issue. But because she took the time to really listen to their story, she was able to help them and she was able to help this older man retain some of his dignity because that is one of the areas that's the most difficult for people who are, who are unable to, to go to the bathroom by themselves. Um, in, in creating a story, we look at narrative linkages. And in narrative linkages, what, what happens is that we assemble spheres of meaning in the context of our, our lifelong experiences. So if we're looking at understanding an oral history, for example, or we're listening to a client's story, we're really looking at, the, at, at how that person as assembles spheres of meaning, but at the same time, telling a story is an act of creation and it's an act of selection. And we're also creating the story. At the same time that we're listening to it, we're also creating it. And every time we tell a story, that story is being told differently. <clears throat> What's very, very important is what voices are not heard. And interestingly enough, in the film with Gloria, she never mentions her son. And I think in some ways it was partly because it was probably too raw and she didn't want to end up crying on the camera, but it's interesting that she talks joyously about her whole family, but she never mentions him. Yet, if you know her story, his story is one of the, his voice is one of the voices that, that is not heard. And it's important when you're listening to somebody talk and tell their story to really also think to yourself what voices are not being heard. In order to really understand the meaning of a story, there are certain things that we should focus on. Um, first of all, is there a theme song? And by a theme song, I mean not only repeated images, but something that is meaningful. For example, in Gloria's case, I think the theme song really had to do with keeping up appearances. Um, and understanding that theme song, again, in the historical context. So if you, if you each took a moment to think about your theme song today, because the theme song changes all the time, what would you, what would you come up with? A lot of people squirming around. Anybody care to share? I can think of let's get together. Yeah. For explanation, with my heart will go on. Anyone else? But think about it and, and occasionally check in with yourself and say, "What's my theme song today?" Um, repeated images are very important because. Repeated images are, are images that are meaningful to this individual in the context of the story. Working with older people, some of whom have, whom have cognitive impairment, there are times when repeated images may signal some kind of cognitive difficulty, but at the same time, people retain those repeated images even at times where the memory is not so good, so focusing on repeated images. What are the turning points in a story? Certainly in Gloria's life, there have been many, many turning points, but a critical turning point for her was when she had to go back to work. And that really, that really changed her whole life in many ways. Um, looking at historical and cultural themes, which we already talked about, is this story <coughs> reflective of a larger story? Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, but usually it is. Usually it's reflective of a larger story. I also like to think about the role of surprise and the meaning of paradox in a story. A lot of times we'll hear something that really is paradoxical and we have to pay attention to that. Yeah, can we, can we speak a little more about um, if the, what you mean by reflective of a larger story? Well, let me see if I can think of an example. Or maybe um, with Gloria or something. Um, yes, with Gloria, the, definitely. I could say, for example, that her, her story is reflective of a larger story, not only the not only the story, let's say, of the of the history of, of what happened in, in, in terms of AIDS, in terms of her son. If we look at it in the context of slavery and the legacy of slavery, um, those are two examples I think of, of how her story is reflective of a larger story. Um, 
one of our more, most important roles is to bear witness. And I want to tell you a little bit about this and why I put a picture of myself in here again. Um, this is a 99-year-old Holocaust survivor. Um, she was in several different concentration camps, managed to survive, and I did a long interview with her. And it was interesting during the interview, she just she wrote a book um, uh, not too long before I did this interview. Unfortunately, she's now suffering from dementia. But um, she wrote a book called Don't Cry For Me, My Sons. And her sons were hidden children during, during the war. She was living in Poland um, when she was deported, and her sons were hidden. And the sculpture that you see in the background is a sculpture that was done by her sister. And it's, this, it's a picture, I don't know if you can make it out on the screen there. It's not coming out too clearly. There's, it's, a, it's a sculpture of a, of a woman with a little boy, and her sister did it after she found um, this woman's son. And what was really amazing was that in the interview, and this was an oral history interview, in the interview, her son had set up the interview with me, and um, uh, he, he said to me, ask her to sing. Even at 99, she has an amazing voice. And it turns out that after the war, she had become part of a, um, a, of a chorus, a Yiddish chorus. Um, she had moved to France and become part of a chorus. And she sang for me three songs in Yiddish. And when she sang, she was really transported back to another time. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. This woman with a kind of a shaky voice suddenly became this young girl. And she really didn't want to focus in the interview on her, um, her, her experience in the camp. She said to me, you can read about that in my book. What she wanted to talk about was her childhood in Poland. They were very, very poor, but there was some wonderful things, and, and she wanted to share that with me. Um, and really, our, our most important role is to bear witness. <laughs> We, we can't change the, the traumatic material, but we can be there for people. Did you have your hand up? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, I like this quote. Each time I tell my story, I remove one small bit of hurt from inside me. I ease my wound. And I'm going to share another story with you now, um, a series of oral history interviews that I've done, actually, with a client. Um, I got permission from the clinic where I work to interview this woman. And we're also going to meet her. The students in the oral history program just met her, but hopefully we'll be able to hear her this time. Um, this is a woman who uh, is now 96, an African-American woman. Um, her name is Marvelous, uh, without the E. And um, she was referred to our clinic because she had become depressed, um, because she was really lost her independence. She'd become physically ill and she couldn't move around anymore and she had she was always used to being very independent and taking care of herself and one of the things that the clinic where i work does is that we do home visits and so she could not get out of bed um, and so i go to her home every week and i do visits with her he alabama and he ended up working as a houseboy for booker t washington and george washington carver and they it was just around the time that they were founding tuskegee um, for those of you who are not familiar with Tuskegee, it's, it's an, it, it was the first university for African Americans in the United States. And um, they encouraged him to, they encouraged him to, um, uh, to go to school. And, uh, and he was able to do that, and he was in one of the first graduating classes. He graduated in 1902, and he moved to Texas, um, and he founded the first technical school for for black young men um, and there's documentation of this and the documentation was gotten by Marvelous after much much difficulty she made three trips to Texas and they would not let her into the archive and finally she found somebody who said well you should go talk to so-and-so in the back room and there was an African-American woman working in the archive in the back room who said to her, I know where we can find the record of this, of this, um, this school, and actually gave it to her. Um, and there is listing with her father's name, and it was called the, the Dallas Negro High School. Um, anyway, her father then had a series of jobs. He married. Uh, he actually married one of his, um, one of his uh, high school classmates, I think. Um, and um, he, they moved to, um, I think they, well, they moved around quite a bit because he had a number of teaching jobs. 
And unfortunately, when Marvelous was 14, he died, um, leaving his, Marvelous's mother with seven children to support, and she had never worked. And typical of, of many stories like this, she moved up north. There was an uncle or somebody, a brother, who, who uh, put them up for a little while, and they moved to, to um, a, a little bit north of Manhattan. And the only work she could get was day work, working as a domestic. Um, and somehow she cobbled together a, a living and enough to put some food on the table, but they were very, very poor. And Marvelous and her sisters all got married when they were very young. Marvelous married at 16 to relieve their mother of the burden of taking care of them. And also, as Marvelous said, there was always a danger that you might get pregnant. And that was a, a, a terribly, terribly shameful thing at that time. Um, so Marvelous married at 16. And it was not a good marriage. And towards the end of the marriage, her husband became abusive. And one night, he kind of went crazy, and he held a knife to her throat. <coughs> and it was the middle of winter, and somehow she managed to take her kids and go next door to a neighbor's house and get away. And she ended up moving to first to the Bronx, because she had a sister there who was, who was managing a bar. And she was able to get a job working in the bar, but then the bar closed and she was left with no source of income. So she moved to New York City and like her mother, she, she got work as a domestic and she worked three different jobs. And there were times where she had no food, she wanted her children to eat and she ended up going to the hospital at one point to the emergency room because she was so weak. And the doctor wanted to give her something to stimulate her appetite. And she said, no, I don't want this because I have no food. She didn't want to. She didn't want to have to to have to eat. She wanted to put the food on, on the table for her kids. Anyway, over the years, gradually, just with with hard work and persistence, she managed to get a job in a department store stamping. Uh, in those days, they had metal charge cards, and she got a job doing that. And she kind of worked her way up, and and um, ended up getting a job as a switchboard operator at an organization called the American Jewish Committee. And in the 1960s, the American Jewish Committee um, was very involved in the civil rights movement. And they sent Marvelous down south many times um, with a delegation of some prominent New Yorkers who were involved in the civil rights movement. And she was in, involved in the March on Selma. And I'm going to show you some pictures from that um, as well. Um, she risked her life many times. She worked closely with some of our great civil rights leaders. And she worked there, she worked with them for 30 years. She became an office manager there. And every member of her family died of cancer. And she had breast cancer twice. And finally, when she retired, she ended up volunteering her time for cancer cares and for a Sloan Kettering. And she won some awards for her volunteer work as well. And when she could no longer walk, she had to quit. And that's the point at which I started working with her. I said to her, Marvelous, you're a living <coughs> archive. She had all kinds of documents and photographs and things like that that she had collected over the years. And I said, you really should write your story. And she said, well, you know, I, my family and my friends have told me this many times, but I don't have anything really that unusual to, to talk about or to say. And I came back to my then supervisor, who's subsequently not there anymore, who was able to think outside the box, and I said, you know, I wish I could record these women's, this woman's stories. They're so fascinating. And she said to me, sign a release form, go for it. Um, and I did. And um, I did 13 audio interviews with her and then a filmed interview. And I said to her, you know, this material should go to an archive unless your daughters are interested in having it. And she checked with them and they said they weren't particularly interested. So I said, what if I were to contact the archive at Tuskegee and see if they'd be interested in having this? Well, the director of the archive called me back and he practically jumped through the phone. He was so excited. And they're in the process now of transcribing the interviews and um, they're, um, they're going to create what they, uh, that's sort of what they call a um, um, digital file cabinet for her uh, in their archive. And I've sent them now with her permission. We copied, I copied for her everything, photographs and all of that, and sent the, sent the material to Tuskegee. And at a certain point, um, she, the phone rang when we were doing these interviews, and um, it was her grandson who wanted to tell her about a new job that, that he had gotten. And she said to him, I can't talk to you now, I'm writing my book. 
And it was just, it was so wonderful. Anyway, unfortunately, about a month ago, she was hospitalized, and she now has cancer that's colon cancer that's metastasized everywhere, and she's dying, and she knows it. And she wants to stay alive long enough to see something come of this, and I'm not sure that she's going to, but I feel as though she knows that there's this legacy, and um, she knows that I'm talking about her at Columbia tonight, and, and I saw her this morning, and every time I leave there now, I, I don't know whether I'm going to see her again. And whenever I go to see her, I walk in as the social worker. I am her social worker, and I'm prepared always to begin with that. But she now wants to talk about her story, and that's really become what, what we do, and it's, it's really been wonderful. Um, I, just a couple of, of quotes that I want to share with you before I show you the pictures and, and show you the film clip of her. Um, the, the French philosopher Simone Weil said, the love of our neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say to him, what are you going through? And I think that that's, in a sense, uh, you know, certainly, uh, certainly as a therapist, that's the most important question we can ask. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how tricky that is when we get into oral history. But the poet Audrey Lorde wrote letters to her therapist, and I think this is something that really speaks to both disciplines when she said, one part of my story is yours too. So let me just introduce you to Marvelous. Um, oops. I hope that you'll be able to hear this. This is a clip. Um, I need technical support here again. Oh, here we go. Okay. We may need to take it out. Yeah. Okay. What has this process of telling the story been like for you? It's It's something that I never expected in my life that I would ever be. If it had been for you, I mean, this, this wouldn't have happened. Because nobody else has ever said, listen to what, I, what we had to say. I asked questions and made me feel it. I never thought what I had accomplished or my family accomplished was anything unusual. You know, I just thought it was par. I just want to show you some of the pictures of her that she shared with me. Um, um, this is on the right there, where it says Odie Fury, uh, Odie Blackman Fury. That's Marvelous's father. And this is with the, this is these are with the school. Uh, this is the school that, that he founded. And actually, where it says Odie on the on the top row there, that's her brother who was a student at the school. This is Marvelous with her husband. And Marvelous is on the first row on the lower right. Um, she belonged to a she belonged to a group. Uh, most of these are sis sisters and cousins, and um, they used to get dressed up and go dancing. Here are just some some pictures from her her life. That actually is her mother on the upper left, and these are Marvelous. That's the rest of Marvelous at various times in her life. And here is the March on Selma, Marvelous is the far left. And one of the things that was quite incredible when she talked about this story was that when they came to leave after the march, first of all, she had to ride on the floor of the car because just a couple days before that, a white woman had been killed riding in the car with a group of, of black men. Um, and um, her life would have been in danger had she been the only black person in a car full of white people. But when it came time to leave, the airline took the staircase away so they couldn't get on the plane because she was with them. And they actually ended up having to take a bus, I think, to Atlanta where they were able to take a plane. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And then I have just one other picture here. <coughs> this, this was marvelous at 92 when she was still up and running around. In fact, she, she told me that when she was, um, I guess she was about 92 or 3, she rented a car and she drove all the way from Massachusetts to South Carolina to visit some relatives. She <laughs> visiting some people in Massachusetts, so she, of 
quite a character. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry to keep doing this with the lights, but if somebody could get the lights again, thanks. So we don't have much time left, but I just um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the the intersection of oral history and therapy, and also the the places where they diverge. Um, when I was a kid, there was a toy that I had. It was a cardboard. And um, on one side, it was a sort of a simple electronic thing. On one side, there were a list of capitals, and on the other side, there were a list of states. And there was like a circuit board on the back with a little red light and two electrodes. And if you got the state and the capital, if they matched up, um, a light would light up and you would get a point. And I often thought of this when I first went to social work school many years ago, because in my days as a social work student, there seemed to be these phrases that I could kind of plug in when I was working with clients, like, that must be very difficult for you. <laughs> and it reminded me of that circuit board, and most of the time, the light lit up, and people really felt understood. Um, I did have one client who was a feisty woman who had been a social worker herself, and when I tried that, she said, don't give me that social worker talk. Um, but most of the time when I said to people, that must be very hard for you, or you must have been through a lot, um, I got this response from people like, wow, you're really listening to me, you really un are understanding what I'm saying. Where does that come in, though, in the oral history interview? And when I met with the, with the oral history students just before um, our, our meeting tonight, this is one of the questions. What do you say, what do you do when somebody's talking about traumatic material? This is really a, a, a workshop for a whole other time, and I don't have time to really go into it now. But one of the things that I've had to learn working in these two disciplines is that there are a lot of points of connection, but there are also times where I really have to sit on my hands, because when I'm working as a therapist, I have the luxury of saying to somebody, um, you know, I noticed when you were talking about your abusive husband, you had a big smile on your face. Can you tell me what's going on behind the smile? Um, I can stop people and I can say to them, what's happening right now? What's going on between us? That's a kind of a luxury that you don't have in an oral history interview. In an oral history interview, sometimes you just have to sit there and let this painful material happen. At the same time, when I'm working as a therapist, I have to be careful because I do use a lot of narrative in my work. I have to be careful that I don't allow myself to get derailed by the story and not necessarily address some important issues like housing or medications or things that are going on right now with this with this particular client because I can really get lost in the story in fact I came across a little report card from my preschool days and, and it said that when I entered the room in the morning it said I I bounce in with my cheerful you know what and proceed proceed to launch into a story so I guess there's a history there for me <laughs> but um, but I have to be careful again that I don't get derailed by the story. And just an example of that is um, is a client that I worked with who was, I, I worked with her and then I, she, she left and she's just come back and I've had one session with her after several years of not seeing her. And she's an African American woman, a Marxist feminist writer. And um, she had gone to a Marxist feminist therapist for many, many years. And what had happened is that she wasn't getting any better. And it turned out she had undiagnosed bipolar disorder and nobody was paying attention to that because they really were looking at the cultural and historical and, and oppressive factors that she had realistically had been living with all of her life. And at the same time, there was this issue that wasn't being addressed. And when she had a psychiatric assessment, and it was discovered that she had this undiagnosed bipolar disorder and she was put on appropriate medication, she was really able to, to start moving forward. And when she came to me, she came to me with a grid that she called personal renaissance. And in the grid were the areas that she wanted to address. And, and I asked her where she wanted to begin and she wanted to begin with her health and the fact that she had not really been taking care of it. But, um, but I have to be careful in a situation like that that I don't get lost in the story, that I really also pay attention to, to the therapeutic aspects. And yet, over and over and over again, I've seen the therapeutic value of narrative, whether it's in oral history or whether it's in therapy. And, um, and what I really would, would like to see someday is a, is a study of, of 
people who have been depressed, for example, who <coughs> tell their stories and whether this has a lasting effect. So um, I'm hoping someday that we can do this. We're just beginning to really, in the field, in the mental health field, really appreciate the value of narrative in, in terms of evidence-based practice at this point. So I think we're sort of coming to the end of the time, but I wanted to leave time for questions and answers. Um, so anybody have thoughts, reflections, questions? Yeah. How do you um, assess if a story is perhaps larger than you might suspect it actually was, or not just how the person is perceiving it, but it may have been, become embellished over time. I think stories do, and I think our job is never to try and get the person to see the, the real story, so to speak, as we might perceive it, but I think, that, I think that our job is really to think about the disconnect that there might be between the story and if we know what the facts are, and to understand what the meaning of that embellishment is for that individual. It, it's something it's something, again, as a luxury, and as a therapist, I can address, you know, the meaning of this, but, but as a neurohistorian, we just make note of it, and, and it, it may tell us something about that individual and, it, and about the meaning of that story for the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, how much of yourself do you share with the client when you're um, interviewing? I know sometimes when people are sharing with us, we kind of feel obligated to share of ourselves, but how do you find that's a, that's a sort of perpetual question that comes up all the time and, and it comes up in both fields. Um, and it's something that, um, that you really have to do, I mean, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but you have to really assess at each point, is this in the service of the other individual or is it something that's in the service of oneself? And I've made the mistake sometimes of sharing things about myself that another person had absolutely no interest in. Um, and I've also, I've also found that there were points of connection in, in, in both areas. I mean, I, uh, as, as part of a, when I was in the oral history program here, as part of the, the program, we were taken to a, um, a, to a, a, a sort of a post-prison um, residential center, treatment center for, for women. And it so happened that one of the guest speakers I had had in my class was somebody who had been in prison. And um, when it turned out that this prisoner I interviewed, this former prisoner I interviewed, had been in the same prison as the woman uh, who had come to speak in my class, I, I was bursting to tell, you know, the, to say something about this prison. And it, it turned out to be a wonderful point of connection, but it could have been a disaster. I mean, you know, when she found out who it was, she said, I love her. She said she was wonderful, you know, and all of that. She said, I never really got to know her. Suddenly it gave me a sort of a, um, I don't know, it gave me kind of a press with her, but I think on some level I may have been doing it because I felt, and, and I was, you know, sort of new at this at that point, but I felt um, somehow that there was this disconnect between us and how was I supposed to connect with this woman? And it, it worked, but it was risky. And I think had I not had these years and years of experience as a therapist, I might not suggest doing something like that. Um, but there have been times where I've shared some, some things with clients or, or with interviewers, and it's been, it's really, it's been a wonderful point of connection. Um, but again, it requires, in either discipline, a continuous sort of self-reflection. You have to be analyzing yourself and working on yourself at the same time. And that goes for the, the whole issue of, of the biases and prejudices that we bring to our work as well. I, I know that's not a very concrete answer, but I think that if I could say one thing, it's really asking yourself, is this in the service of the other person or am I doing this for some conscious or unconscious self-serving reason? So. I just had a question as far as you mentioned before how oral historians um, would just have to listen when someone was maybe recounting a traumatic experience. Um, what what services are in place like when that's done? Or is is that it? Like you just leave the person at the Well end that's of that. something that came up in our in our earlier discussion and, and Marie actually had had talked about I don't do you want to say something about what you had said because I think that's a really good way of yeah. doing it. Thank you. Well there's 
when you end an interview and someone is clearly visibly distressed, um, one of the things as an oral historian that you can do is just simply offer to speak to the person um, after the interview, let them have some time, and, and say, you make yourself available to them. And that's what I do. Um, you know, for the next couple days, I prioritize their emails or, or messages and spend some time speaking with them um, to let them know, yes, indeed, I did um, hear that this was a very painful story. And most of the time, it, what they're looking for is that, in fact, you heard what they intended for you to hear. And, and that's usually the end of that. Um, and as an oral historian, of course, we're not doing therapeutic work. Um, so we need to be really mindful of the fact that um, if someone tells you something, um, what steps can you take? You know, and what steps do you need to do? Uh, every once in a while, there is a situation where you encounter someone where you, you, you might have to suggest, especially if it's a long-term relationship, you're doing many interviews, that they might seek you know, a professional, but that's, that is not the norm, but you certainly do not step in and, and do professional work. And, and I think not only for the person who's being interviewed, but also for the interviewer, I mean, the whole issue of vicarious traumatization, and I know Columbia, Columbia has done a huge 9-11, post 9-11 project, and they actually ended up hiring a team of psychologists for the interviewers because some of them were really traumatized by what they were hearing in the interview. So it's just something something to be aware of. And, and it is one of the dangers of, of, of oral history, in a sense, um, as well. So. Yeah. So I, um, I'm interested in the relationship between the interviewer and the much I, if, if I was listening to, to the narrator all the time thinking, oh wait a minute, is that my stuff? How am I listening? I mean I would not be able to hear <laughs> that other person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so of course if you're recording it then that sort of leads frees that because you can listen to it again later. <clears throat> but so is it about trying to be transparent and say this is who I am in writing or I am, and this is how I'm understanding um, this person. This is this is this is my stuff. Um, you know how how would you? I'm not saying how do you, but yeah. how would you address that? Well, I think certainly if you're writing. Um, being self-reflective is is informative for people who are reading what you're writing. Um, in terms of what's going on and the sort of parallel process that might be going on during the interview, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily share this with um, with somebody I'm doing an oral history with. In therapy, I, I might. And in fact, um, uh, often uh, if I have, a, let's say, if, if it's a person of color, I might say to that person right up front, how do you feel about having a white therapist? And, um, and, and I've done this many times, and I've generally gotten a positive response for having asked the question. Um, I don't always, and there are always going to be differences between you and the person you're interviewing, and, and those differences, you know, we can't erase who we are, um, but we can be aware of what the implications of, of our own culture may mean to another person. But the fact that a person is agreeing to give an oral history generally means that person wants to tell his or her story, and it, and it usually means that they are appreciating the fact that they're being heard. And, and I think, again, that, that the gift of, of listening to somebody, truly listening to somebody, which when we're interviewing, we're doing. Um, in, in fact, I find that the concentration required for an oral history interview is, is much more intense than what's required in a therapy session, where I can stop and interrupt, and there's a bit back and forth, and, and you know, people ask me questions and that kind of thing. Whereas in the oral history interview, you're really picking up the threads all the time, and, and um, but there are times when I when I've really tried to become I've become aware um, of the fact that I was I was feeling a certain way because of something somebody was saying, and not just in terms of traumatic material. Somebody who might have been presenting something that I found admirable, and I thought, oh, if only I could have done that, or you know, something of that sort as well. So. 
Any other questions, reflections? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> One thing, my mother who's sitting at the end of the table there, I interviewed her and that was the hardest interview I've ever done. <laughs> and when she was done, she said, I hope my grandchildren don't ever listen to this. <laughs>